remember I've got a, a video that I've stuck on YouTube with, with what we've done. So I'll talk through it because I don't think the sound's going to travel off here. Um, but I'll just play, so this is an example. This meadow here is um, it's a National Nature Reserve. Um, it's an SSSI. And there's over 200 uh, wildflower and grass species in this meadow. It's one of the most diverse in the country, so we'd love to have it nearby to us. And we've got access to the, to the hay. Um, and so one of the things we've got, so we're straight in. Oh, it works, look at that. That never happens in technology. Okay, um, you hear that? East Haddo in Worcestershire. Uh, you can probably hear the tracks coming behind me, but we're just having a look here at um, the wildflower meadow. Uh, absolutely teeming with wildflowers in here. There's loads of orchids, green winged orchids, fragrant orchids, cotton spotted orchids. Um, there's over 200 species in here. And this is what it looks like before we harvest. It's the 15th of July today. Uh, we're probably a little bit late. We might miss some of the seed. And we'll just come over here and, and have a look at what's going on with the uh, with the harvest. We've got Adrian Viter, who's the contractor, who's helping us out with this. Um, and his team on here, they're mowing and bailing at the same time. I'm going to shout because you probably can't hear over the top of these machines, but you can see you've got a nice fairly old baler on there, so hopefully it won't be wound too tight on the bales for when we unwrap them. Um, and once it's safe to do so, I'll just come onto, onto the side here and we'll have a look what it's picking up. And I'm hoping that with this material, it's not too long, so it's not going to wrap when we put it with a muck spreader later on. So we're just picking up there. You can see I've never made a camera just how there. much wildflowers <laughs> there are in there. And uh, once we've got all this packed up with the bales, uh, we're going to pick it up, stick it on the trailer, and we'll take it home. And once we get home and start spreading, I'll, uh, I'll start the video again and we can have a look. One last thing to look at here is just in terms of the bare ground. Uh, we've had the Rotera on here, which is a power arrow. And with the ridge and furrow, it's not that even a spread of bare ground on here. But it's not too bad. And I don't think it's such a bad thing that you've got patches where it's you know, quite a lot of soil and patches where it's not so much. Cause if it takes variably across the whole pasture, then I'm not too worried about that. So it was just a shallow pass with a with a power arrow to prepare the ground, and then we put the rest of this on, spread this on afterwards, um, and you see how it's going on your rod. Okay, I'm just going to show you very loosely wrapped bales. I think that's the key. We've just put the spike into the bales. Um, the old uh, temperature bale spike, and they're still cold, even though they've just come over there. I think they're wrapped loosely. This stuff doesn't warm up so quick either. Um, and we're just trying to calibrate the uh, speed of the bed on the muck spur because we're trying to do it slowly so it doesn't wrap. <coughs> um, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, I'm just trying to shake it up while we put it in the muck spur here. Okay, we seem to have the best speed about right. Oh, we're getting a few big lungs coming out, but that's better now. We're going to speed up a bit so we don't get too much spread too thick. That's going okay. We can always come and spread this out a bit. We're going to have a look and see what the coverage is like. Idea. You can see you've got the bare ground underneath. So you're coming into a little bit of soil contact with seed, you can already see some seed dropping out from there. And that's pretty much complete green coverage, very good. Right, there we go. So it, 
just to say that obviously there's lots of different options in terms of um, what we're doing. We don't just do this, but this has been a really effective way for us to get a really quite, you know, all these different species are really expensive when we go to the seed merchants. But if you've got a wildflower meadow nearby or someone who's in environmental schemes, you've got that diversity, and you, then you can get the green hay in that way and harvest it, it's just a fraction of the cost of doing it. The one thing I would say is <clears throat> with the power harrowing, I've definitely noticed it does have a negative impact of the carrying capacity of the ground for two or three years. You are, it, it, even though it's only a surface cultivation, it does seem to have an impact on that. Um, but after two or three years, we then see massive increases in organic matter really quickly from the, from the diversity <coughs> that we get there. And, and we're, we're up to about, so the meadow's got 200 species, the meadow, the, the, the pasture that it's going on to, they probably already got about over 20 species, but we're up to 50 or 60 species now in our pastures by bringing in these different species. And what's interesting, we did this, when was that? So 2015? I think that might be when it was uploaded actually. So we probably did that, uh, 20, I think that was summer 2014 actually. And there's new things, new species popping up from the seed that was dropped then, that are popping up now. And they're only just starting to come in. So sometimes this does take time. I think also, some folks had already talked about before with the, um, uh, like bringing in mycorrhizal fungi or trying to add in all this sort of fungal diversity and bacterial diversity. One of the benefits of this is because you're bringing all of that green material from the other side, that's covered in the spores and bacteria that are in the soil of, of, the, of the donor site. And so when we bring it, we bring in all that stuff with us. And so for example, a lot of the orchids that we've had come in from this um, from doing this sort of thing. They've got very specific uh, species of mycorrhizal fungi that they need to actually flower and, and live. And if you don't have those mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, those orchids won't come. But because we're bringing it with us on the plant material, we've got that there as well. And I think that's probably the same for a lot of the plants. And it makes you realise, really, these, these native grasslands that sort of without man's in intervention in prehistory, like all that diversity of, of fungal action in the soil and the impact that has and the different kinds of seeds and the different kind of roots of that diversity, that's a lot of that we just haven't got. And so, you know, I, I think there, there is a real benefit to this. The other thing I was chatting earlier on, um, was saying that uh, arable farm, a neighbour of mine, uh, who's he's a, he's a crack and chap, he's, He's in his early 70s, he left school at 14, and he was Mr. Chemical. You know, just try it on as much as you can, more on, more on. And, and he's basically been totally sold by all this regenerative agriculture stuff. And now he's composting, and he's bought himself a microscope that's got like a computer screen on it. And he can now identify the bacteria and the protozoa and the different sort of fungal types. He's, he's, he's incredible, he's, and he's getting waste apples from a local orchard, you can't sell their apples, and then he's getting you know, free wood chip, and he's, and he's putting you know, some of his hay, and he'll get some old meadow hay, and, and he'll compost, compost that all together. So he's putting compost on at quite high rates, and he's getting um, you know, five ton, five tons of the acre crops on his, on his first weeks, and he's just flying with it. And, uh, but he's got a very different attitude in that he's like, Stop really telling people about this, I've got an advantage. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he saw what we were doing with this, and his, his, his guy's always really switched on to sort of new, new ideas and have a go. And he realised, because he was, he was using um, legume break crops in his arable rotation, and he was obviously buying the legume seed and putting all that on. And then he thought, well, what if I've just got a couple of fields that I just keep as sort of diverse legume legs? And so he bought himself a, um, a, um, a brush harvester because we got him to help us do, do some of this work. <coughs> so then he's harvesting, essentially harvesting the green plant material from those legumes, from those legumes. And he, then he'll just broadcast that on after, after he's had his uh, wheat crop and a little bit of cultivation. And it's all really cheap, really for, you know, it's free. The seed's expensive, isn't it? And, you know, if you can cut those costs out. And um, so he also uses hay as a break crop and sells a lot of horse hay and race horse hay and other bits and pieces. So we've got like a Western Wilds ryegrass straight and he'll put that in 
and then have the first crop the hay off it. And then he'll come in after that and broadcast the legumes on top of that afterwards. And then they will start to come in. And he's starting now to, to add even more species in, but it's a really cheap way of doing it. There's no seed cost. Just takes him a day, a day's work, the tractor and equipment he's already got. And um, you, you know, you can do quite a lot. Any questions on any of that pro process? Right, well, if you have cattle come in on top of that after you spread the grass, what difference would that be? Yeah, the long term. Yes, well, we do we do that. So what I'll then do, I haven't got that on the, on the rest of the video, but is that green material then make, so like, and then the seed, you get the seed drop, and then I'll ted it and roll it, and then we'll let the grass come up so there's something for the, the cow to eat, and then we'll hit it quite hard, and actually hit it quite hard in the winter, so that you're sort of holding back some of the more dominant grass species to allow some of the some of those herbs to come in. And then again, we'll hit it in the spring, but then we'll let it, you know, we'll let it go. But it's interesting, I've spoken to other people who've done similar things where they've done this, and then they've left it for entire growing season then. Um, so they've hit it hard with the cattle, and then they've left it for 12 months and let everything just come through. Cattle directly on top after you put that nowhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's different ways of doing it, but it's, you know, for those arable farmers, it's the same principles. Essentially, you've got to get soil contact with that seed in order for it to grow, um, for it to be viable. How many bales per acre is it working on to put in the Basically, um, you get you can spread. Probably easier to think of it about the donor site compared to to that. So it's about a three to one. So that so about three. Um, so one hectare of that donor site, or one acre, would do three hectares or three acres of a field. Um, and you can just do it slowly as you go around the farm. That was just a part field we started off. And would you would you disturb the seed too much if you used a forage harvester and actually filled your 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 bees or your your mock spreader? Would it be too much? Would it be chopped up too much? Well, I think one thing we have we have done that. Um, I'm not sure, and uh, we fired it straight into the muck spreader because obviously you saw it yeah. because of the bales, it was jammed on the, on the muck spreader. So that's what we've done since then. But I do wonder if we're using a fair bit of seed when it's going up the auger and, yeah. and whatever else. The one thing we, we have learned actually is, is it's quite a good thing to do it on, um, on like a damp, drizzly morning so, it's kind of so the seed all sticks to the green material. And that also, if, you, if you're doing it, in, if you're rapid bales to shift it, um, then that having it down for also stops it heating up a little bit. But that's quick. Uh, we found run. Well, what time of the year would you do that? So that was 15th of July. Yeah. So, but at any time, sort of from early July on, when all that seed's available and ripe in, the, in all the different plants. Yeah. That's something else we did. So there's some species in here that don't flower until. Uh, kind of August time and even into September. So you could uh, go in at different times to get different seeds from different plants. It's a really problem with slugs. It's something I, I've tried something similar, well not exactly similar, but I've, I've had tried to germinate seeds and I've had slugs come in and just wipe out the whole lot. Yeah, we haven't had problems with slugs to be honest. Um, so yeah, I think you know, just standard stuff with that though, I guess, is it's whether it's um, making sure it's rolled or... I think that's where I was wrong, yeah. Yeah. But, it, yeah, sometimes you just, you know, mother nature throws a curve. You, you think that they're rolling would, would start that out? I don't know, to be honest. Um, we have done... So on the other part, that was a part field we did on this field here. But the rest of it, we did. I did a third of the field with this. I did a third of the field where we power harrowed and then um, and then broadcast some bought seed on, so not from this site. And then the last bit, we didn't do any field preparations at all, we just broadcast the seed on. Um, and actually the bit that we didn't do any anything on, we just broadcast seed on and then grazed the cattle quite hard on, that actually came reasonably well. And it didn't come until year three and four. So it just took that time. So I thought I'd wasted a lot of money in this. I was pleased to see it appear. Um, right, let's see if we can get this thing out. Any more questions on that? What, why did you not come up in year three or four? 
I guess the, the the conditions just weren't right for it to start with, and that's something I see with a lot of the wildflower species is that quite often, uh, particularly with that with the process we just showed you, uh, some species just never don't come for that time. So whether the soil's got to be prepared a certain way, or or whether there's a small seedling that just sort of sits still for a few years that I'm not seeing, um, and then I look pretty hard, but. I've, I, I think probably it's just the soil conditions and perhaps the the right mycorrhizal fungi and whatever's just got to be there for it to work. I was just wondering um, if the if the cattle the, how much of the seed would go through if you fed the bears the cattle or would would some seed stay viable to the room or not? Yeah, as a rule when you're feeding hay, um, the small seeded plants like particularly like the legumes. Yeah. will still be viable and now that's germinating the dung quite often. So, what so the bigger seeds be, tend to be yeah. partly digested. Because I was just thinking if you fed cattle, you know, if you block the cattle through that and fed entails, would they distribute it? And, um, yeah, no, and that's, that's something else that we do. So I'll, if I'm like, so I'll go through some of the things that see if I can get this to work. Fingers crossed. Well, right. That was the presentation I did this morning, but we didn't get much to the end, did we? So, um, so yeah. So these are some of the species that we've got just popping up, and the orchids that are coming in. And I think that's, you know, whilst there's not a lot of nutrition in an orchid, but I do think it's a good sign of a healthy soil with the kind of uh, diversity of fun fungal um, associations going on there. Um, And then if we go through. So here's this is another site where we've done some green hay strewing and then we've got the green wind orchids coming in. This is a field here. Um, this is one of the arable fields uh, that we seeded down uh, with a mix of um, uh, 27 grasses and herbs. So that's the, the base. <coughs> Um, so that's a starting point in terms of our diversity. But you can see that the river plantain's gone pretty well. Um, you can see the, the white uh, yarrow in flower and, and the upside daisies. And this is after it's been, that's after we hayed it the first year. So that was after it had been hayed, and then it came back. And that was actually having taken on this farm and taken a fair bit of stick uh, for bringing all these weeds back into the local area from, the, from the, my new neighbours. What was quite pleasing was we took the hay cut and because of the deep roots, even in a year, so this was this was taken sort of 12 months after it was seeded down in, in August. Um, and in the drought year, all of those deep rooted plants just came back green in the drought, whereas everyone's rye grass was straw yellow. Um, you know, and we're, and our cows were doing fantastically in the dry on that, on that feed. So you can see this is what we do is September, October time, uh, if we can find a dry time, I'm behind this year because I haven't got everything, all the bales out because, we, because it's been so soggy, I've been waiting for a dry time but I'm just going to have to go and do it. Um, but yeah, we place the bales out across the pasture and we we're basically, so I'll be, I know at the start of the dormant season um, how many cattle I've got and how much, what standard forage I've got. Um, and so there's probably about just over 3,000 kilos, to look at the picture, there's about just over 3,000 kilos per hectare of dry matter there. And then I'll work out how many cows, and then I'll work out the areas, so what my cells are gonna be when I get to graze them later in the year. And then I'll place the bales out. So on this place at the moment, there's a mob, on this, on this platform, there's a mob of 40 cows and calves. And so I'll basically do, um, two bales, so one bale does 20 cows for a day. And so I'll put those, so they'll graze that paddock for two days, and then I'll roll two bales in the following day for them, and then I'll roll and unroll those two bales the next day. And, and just like uh, your man said, absolutely unrolling the bales. These are all full of species ripped here. There. These are some of the 200 species meadow bales. And we've got some similar meadows that are you know, not quite as nice, but you know, over 100 species. 
And when you roll them out, quite often you'll go within two years' time and you'll just have strips where the bales were, where you've got all this diversity and all these species coming in. Um, and that, so that's another really good way of, of adding in that diversity. And the good thing about it is it's, it's doing it in a way that is, you're feeding your cattle, you're wintering your cattle, um, any wasted hay actually ends up doing two things. It adds, it adds to long-term productivity of that area. Um, and obviously you've got the kind of available nitrogen in the year and the manure that's going along those strips as well. And then the other thing is, you know, all that extra feed, it's kind of it's adding a little bit of fertility that's passing through the cattle as well. And with the water, the extra water that will be taken on while they're on there in the winter for a bit longer. Whereas if you have a process where you're going to oversee and you start adding in uh, time on the track to start the track to fuel costs, uh, maybe you're going to put something behind the tractor to scarify and then you're going to broadcast off. So you're just adding in, they're all costs, well this is something that you're doing while you're feeding your capital just running your business. So it's just not adding that extra cost into what you're doing. And long term, we're adding fertility, we're adding diversity, and you know, we're feeding your capital at the same time. <coughs> so that's... And you can see there that it, uh, the herons often come in and they'll, they'll just hang out with the, with the cows in the winter. This is a site here, there's about 250,000 visitors a year to this parkland. So there's quite a lot of people around and actually the herons find that they get protection from the, or less disturbance when they're amongst the cows. So, this is just some of the bale grazing you see in North, in North America, particularly in, in Canada. Um, this is on a, a farm um, in, I think it's near Manitoba, that's, uh, it's the Nervas brothers, you can follow them on Twitter. And there's also a Gallagher um, fencing video on YouTube about what they do with their bale grazing, so that's really worth checking out. And um, Aaron Nervas actually uses some similar genetics. He's got some um, some very similar genetics to us in terms of the native Angus um, that he uses over there, slightly smaller framed, um, uh, low maintenance cows, um, and they keep them out all year. This is a this is not his farm, that's somewhere else. Um, and then this, these are ours. So these bales actually came from that the hay that I showed you on the the uh, the arable land that we seeded down. So 27 species in here, um, and you know, as I showed you before, there was some pugging, uh, but it wasn't too bad. And you can see what we've done is we've given them about three or four rows, and I've just gone and taken the net wrap off those, and then tipped all the bales up, um, and there's no ring feeders. They do pull it underneath them a bit more without the ring feeders, I find, and it keeps them up. So if you, I find if, if I was to use, for a start, I, don't, I can't afford that many ring feeders. Uh, at once, but also I do find the ring feeders is where they put the front feet down and just keep them packed in a ring, whereas if you just let them around the bale, yes there's some waste, but if straw's the same cost as, as hay anyway, then I don't see it as a problem, because it's, it's adding fertility and it's keeping them up. And where you find where those bales were in circle, even if you just do it individually, if you weren't that rolling, uh, we find the fertility if you not necessarily the year you do it, but the following year after that winter, the fertility in those spots is incredible, and you do get the diversity, even if you just leave the bale in situ. Do the, do the bales not get really wet and rot? No. no, you lose about uh, two or three inches around the outside, so you can see a dark patch on some of those, which is where they were lay on. The, that was the bit that was in contact with the floor, but you tend to get, um, again, it's only two or three inches, and the hay in the middle is absolutely. Perfect. You know, you sort of you're rolling it out on a crisp winter morning, and it's you know it's like smell of summer coming out. Um, this hay here was because it was in the, it was in the drought year that we took it. You can see it's almost straw like it's that yellow, um, but that's just the year we had. But the cattle were still held condition on it really well. Is there a reason Rob, that you're doing this system rather than uh, rolling over unrolling individual bales over a wider area? Yeah. So. We have the bales unrolled over the whole area. You can see that white house in the distance. So we've grazed that field and rolled bales out on it. 
So we do that across the whole grazing platform, across the whole pasture. And then basically when we run out to the stockpile, we can then go into here for another six weeks, eight weeks, depending on how many cows we've got. That's the shed. That's the shed. So it's, it's kind of like cut a few weeks of housing almost, but without the cost of the shed and, and with the benefits of the added fertility. The key thing for me was when we started doing this, we were, we were just doing it on the stockpile without hay. Our stocking rate was only um, four acres per livestock unit. So whilst that still added up when it was cheap grass, um, on this farm, we've got much higher rent, so we needed a higher stocking rate. So our rent per head wasn't too high. Um, and that, but this is how we've done that. Yeah, so what's your stocking rate and how do you define stocking? So my stocking, stocking rate is really sort of, I'm thinking about carrying capacity. Um, so it's, I look at it as that all the cattle, so if you, if you just look at all the cattle on the holding, um, from cows to calves and, and whatever else, and give them a, they, you know, depending on their size, depends on what, how much they are, and also their size obviously changes over time for the calves. So just allocate that, and then to the total carrying capacity of livestock units that you have per hectare, essentially. And we're basically... Um, is a cow or livestock unit? A cow, yeah. So a livestock unit is like a Holston dairy cow. In, in the UK, that's how we define it. And um, my cow would probably be let, would be about, I think it's about 0.75 um, of, of one of those. Um, and, and yeah, so we, and we run about, we're about two, at the moment, we're about 2.2 .2 acres to a cow, but that's because we're building up numbers because we took on extra land and I couldn't afford just to stock it all straight away. Uh, but I think we can easily get to two acres to a cow on an organic system. Um, over the whole year or over the winter period? That's over the whole year, and that's, but that, and that's over the winter period, it's the same thing really, because uh, the winter stocking rate is essentially that's the limit on, on my stocking rate. So that's how I look at it. And it's something, because doing these talks, it's something I often get challenged on is the stocking rate side of things for people who are really pushing that side of things. Um, and so it's something that I've, I've gone after a bit to see what we can do. But I think long term, what I notice is that the, the higher we start pushing that stocking rate, the more, or well, the less resilient, the more at risk we sort of make ourselves if we get extreme weather events like droughts or whatever. So it's what that risk is, and that balance of risk return and is it worth that few extra quid in a good year uh, that actually puts the whole operation at risk in a bad year? <coughs> so that's what I'm having. Why wouldn't you put a, a, a fence, an extra fence in front of a row of that? That's what we do. Oh, you do do that? So but we started doing that. You can see here, you might just see a post there. Yeah. And then those bales are fenced off. Yeah. Um, and we started just giving them one strip. I think there were 70 cows and calves in that group at that time. So that was um, eight, I think we had eight bales in a strip. Um, but we found that it was, it was just a little bit intense uh, for how much, and they, and they weren't, they were wasting perhaps a little bit more. Um, and so we started giving them three or four uh, rows at a time instead. You see, what I, I actually do is I put bales out and I just put a fence in front of them and let the heat under the fence keep it out. Yeah, okay. That, you know, it's, it's I have done that. I've just found that yeah. I've got a few bold cows that will just, they'll put the heads under and they just start keeping <laughs> going sometimes. And you end up, and they're in all bales. So um, I also find, because we've got cows and calves here as well, that, you know, in inclement weather or whatever, if we've got rather than eight bales, We've got 24 bales, then, you know, or even, and that's really, each one of those bales is also a little bit of shelter, a little bit of shade for the car, cows and calves, and so all of that sort of came into the thinking. I, I haven't got it perfected yet. In the States, I, I sort of, I went back to what they do in Canada, and uh, Aaron, I had a chat to Aaron about it, and he, they basically have a pod of three weeks worth of bales, and they just stick them in there for three weeks, and then, That'll be on a dry part of the farm, and then after three weeks, in the middle of winter, they'll go and drive them to the next pod for another three weeks over there. And then, yeah. Now, what I did before is just get having another fence and a row of bales and just graze this lot of bales and then just 
Yeah. 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 Would haylage work or would the fermentation process kill the seed? It quite possibly kill the seed, yeah. <coughs> you I think some of it survives, but I don't think, well, I think you probably wouldn't get the same result. And I, I'm not sure um, <coughs> what the. Uh, like I would much rather have hay going on top of the ground and silage on top of the ground in terms of the organic matter. So, but. Are you storing the hay? In the shade and then putting it up in September, October, or are you stockpiling it in the corner of the field and putting it up? Yeah, so we, we just put it in the, we just put it in a field along a hedge, and so what we'll do is first year I made the mistake of stacking some and uh, or or putting it round side to round side, um, and when the bales touch on the sides, you just get a bit too much wastage. But so what we've done is you know like just having it in like a long tube, flat side to flat side. And then there's very little wastage. There's no wastage really where the bales touch the borders and get down there. It's just where it's on the ground that you get a little bit. Well, well, how long have you actually been doing the bale gigs? I know before you were lots of keen on it. You were looking for kind of a lot more stock for it. I was probably too bad to carry a lot more keep something far away above it. So how many years have you been doing this? Um, well, the, when you came to the National Trust place at Prue, yeah. I wasn't allowed to use bales to unroll there, uh, but I am now. So it's taken me about three years to convince them that I should be able to do it. Um, and they, you know, they've been really good as landlords and, and allowed that. Um, I was doing this, certainly doing the bale unrolling at, at home um, for well, back then. Um, I do think though that We'd done the, the tall grass grazing and this grazing for three or four years before we started doing the bales, as you say. And I think that the, the key thing is that I know some folks have just jumped straight into it, and if they haven't sorted out the soil structure and they haven't sorted out the organic matter levels, then it may be that there isn't the soil structure to hold them up yet. You might have to put a few years in first and just change the grazing system maybe give you a situation where you can extend at each end of the season, extend your grazing so your housing periods um, lower, um, and then move to this system in the future. But you've always, if you've got a shed there, obviously you've got an option. Um, but I know, a you know there's, a, there's a farm not far away that have done this, and they're, they're now out wintering, and now they're looking at um, all their livestock sheds and thinking, well, what are we going to do with these now? So, you know, it looks like they're going to either convert them into industrial use or, or storage or something. So, but that's another income stream on the farm. So, uh, and that's actually given us an opportunity on that place because they can see the opportunity to, to, to develop the buildings. And they, so, if we can manage that process for them, then we get the access to the land as well. Do you harrow that or to see the residents? So, I left that as it is. And I wasn't sure whether that was the right thing or not, um, and it did look, it did look a bit of a mess uh, when we did it. But you know, the following August, it was, it just came, came right. It was absolutely fantastic. So um, there were a few patches where it was a bit too much deep litter. You can see on the top left, and we got um, said that was left over. But whilst that will be the case in year one or the. So we finished grazing that bale pod in March. This is the following August in the same year. So we've got that bit of residue, but 12 months time, that'll be gone completely. And the beauty of this is, we're adding so much organic matter to the soil, along with all that plant available nitrogen and the manure, that it just really kicks up, kickstarts that nutrient cycling program. And this was a field that was quite compacted. It had been arable ground, been quite abused. So we've just thrown a huge amount of organic matter and a bit of, it's like getting that flywheel of production going, that nutrient cycle going. And now you've got the grass growing, we can go in and manage that carefully. We will graze that very carefully for three or four years, so we won't be there in the wet, you know. But, you know, we managed to hold cattle on 
about four acres for quite a, quite a period. So it doesn't take a big big area to do it. Either. In some areas of the country, we probably double the rainfall due to that. Yeah. Do you, do you think that would affect you know, the amount of analysis you would have in the field? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, may, maybe in a, in a wetter year, you do see a little bit more wastage around the edge, but it's not massive. Um, <coughs> um, I, I certainly think soil type matters, um, but where I know there are folks doing this now in, in Wales, they're on 60, 70 inches, uh, and that's, uh, you know, and they're happy to do it, but they're on pretty free training ground. So you see, I mean, if you see anyone who's got, you know, if you're running kale uh, for winter grazing and you, you, know, you put the silage bales out and, and run that system, if you can run that system, you can run this system. That's the question. But I think this is a way, I got some consultancy off um, Roger Savory, Alan Savory's son, uh, for, uh, for setting this up. And he actually said, choose your worst bit of land to do this, where your soil's the most happy to kickstart it. But the bale rolling, because you're moving across the pasture and you're grazing it and unrolling, you need to have the soil structure to do that. And so there's a bit of a balance, because we know we're buggering up the soil structure when we do this. That's the reason, you know, we have poaching to force compaction, but we, we put the species in that can pull that compaction right, and now we've got the production going, we'll be able to break that pan and, and it'll sort itself out as long as we look it. When would you return to that patch to bail graze again? So we probably, whether we will return to that exact patch to, to bail graze again, I don't know. Um, so, but we, we will rotate it around. So I've got, there's that's, there's a six acre, there's a 25 acre field that we fenced off, planted some trees, planted some orchards. So there's about 20 acres left, of which that was a six acre patch, and we used four acres of that. And then we're probably going to go around the rest of the 20 acres um, and bale graze on those sort of five acres at a time. Um, uh, once we've done that, there'll be five years sitting in there, um, and I'll know a lot more by then. Do you have any sorry, do you measure the weight gain of the wind the calves? Um, we haven't measured the weight gain on the calves. We look at frame size and body condition score. So we don't really look at that. It's kind of, I'm kind of scared to, to measure it because it might make me make a decision on the basis of it. But essentially, as long as we've got the frame size and the early growth rate and the sexual maturity, you know, we, we only put the bull in for 60 days and then we keep the heifers that come in the first two cycles. Um, so that we're selecting on the basis of fertility, and that's the key for us. So it's so we've got basically. I'm I'm not selecting on size at all. I'm letting the environment select on size. <coughs> by it seems to me that we're you know as I said I've got a broad when I started out with, with the Angus we had a broad spectrum some big Angus cows and some smaller ones, and we seem to be hitting somewhere in the middle is whatever is bringing it back to is the ones that are getting cut you know repeatedly <coughs> Anything that goes open is down the road. Um, and that was an expensive process to start with, but we're sort of getting there now that we're pretty happy with what we've got now. Mm. Um, <coughs> do you have yellow rattle in your in the species mix and do you think that's an important um, wildflower to open the door for other diversity? I think it definitely can be. So that was a, the question was do we use yellow rattle? And we have done certainly, and it's in our pastures. It certainly came into the one we just saw with the muck spreader. Um, and it, it's it's a heavy parasite, so it's it does photosynthesize, but it's also a parasite on grass, and it tends to have its biggest impact in uh, May and June in terms of restricting grass growth at that time. Um, if you have too much of it, it can really set you back in terms of how much forage you've got in, in May and June. But once it's finished flowering. Um, it then the grass just seems to go mad once the impact of that has disappeared and so July August grass is very good in those places where we've got uh, where we've got it. But because it take it does set back the uh, more dominant grasses, it does make space as you say for some of the herbs to come in. And I think it might be just part of the process that you've got to go through to get some of these species in. So you lose a bit of productivity by having it. But then uh, over time it's going to improve. And we found actually that 
once everything starts to reach a balance, it just gets slightly less yellow at the raffle and it just reach, reaches a balance and it doesn't have too much impact in the long term. Any more? Anyone else got any experience of adding in species other than that? They want to bring forward? So what you said, um, it's taken a few years. I just tried frost seeding, um, just a, a, a Cotswell seeds mixture a few years ago in quite frosty weather. And I thought it was a total waste of time. But after two or three years, I've seen lots of little chicories and plantains and similar ones. It just took time for it to yeah. for some experiment. Yeah, so frost seeding for those is so basically putting it on in February time, the trial January, trying to get frost. So the frost cracks the seed and scarifies the seed through that freezing process, freezing and thawing, which then hopefully if you've got soil contact with the seed will, will make you know get the germination. That's supposed to work well for legumes. So, but if you've had chicory as well and plantain has worked on it, yeah, that's interesting. <coughs> I am done bale grazing, like what you're doing there, <coughs> and uh, I also did silage bale grazing with a ring feeder. <coughs> and actually, with Rick Marangu, and we chatted with you on the phone a while ago about yeah. getting some tips regarding going. I was feeding cows at the time. Yeah, you were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but with the regarding the the problem with silage bales and where I put them out on their ends um, in September. It was the year of the drought and I didn't have the stockpile grass coming in with the for December grazing. But anyway, I December grazed it anyway and um, but I what I found obviously was that since the silage bales have been sitting on their end, they've had a bald spot underneath them. So when I when I would tear the plastic off, run throw the ring feeder over the bale at that twenty head or ten head into one ring feeder, and um, they'd graze that off, they'd move into the next paddock that I'd have poly wired. But then what I do is I lift the ring feeder, move that with the side of the bale. Then I have the the round disc of plastic that was on the bottom of the bale. Yeah. And I pull that off and I have my ball spot there. And I just get a handful of seed and I put it in on that and mm. cover the residue then back over it. So it warmed up and it seemed to not affect from snow or frost or anything because the residue was protecting all the seed. So with an acre bag of seed, would do a, go a very long way, and and I know, I thought it was the results were incredible the following summer. But mm. I have one question for you regarding the the hay bale bale raising. Yeah. Um, and when I was speaking to you before, you said add extra wraps of net to your bales to help propel water more. But how many wraps have you been putting on your bales, or are you concerned about that in your area? Um. Yeah, I mean, I tr certainly tried this year. We went for a contractor who had got a uh, brand new uh, coon um, uh, round balers. And they did a really tidy job on the bales. Um, and it's one of those things is that you ask the contractor to put more wrap on. And um, well, that will cost money, doesn't it? So <laughs> if you can still charge for it, not put it on. So, yeah, so we didn't necessarily get the more on that we wanted. But I do think the quality of the bales is important. So if you can get a, a modern round bale with a hard centre, it gives you a really good firm bale. Um, and that seems to shed the water really well. And also there's the wider net wrap that just covers over the, the, the edges of the bale as well. I think that's quite good. Um, because particularly when you're moving them, so if I'm bringing them from trailer from one of the sites to another, um, and then unloading them and whatever, you can they start to get a bit of, you start to get a bit of misshape on the bales and they don't shed water as well. So the better, the better you can make them, and the better you can wrap them, all the better. Okay. Okay. And if um, stock are only going into stock of uh, grass um, in, say, in February, the nutritional value would be very low at that stage. It, we haven't found it to be the case, actually. And actually, when you get into February, you start getting some new season growth coming in. And it's interesting, because the other thing I've noticed is in terms of the energy requirements, the starch is important in terms of the energy requirements rather than, say, the protein for growth and whatever. But things like coxfoot, for example, if you look at the base of a coxfoot plant at that time of year, and the, if you allow it to become a tussock, tussock rather than if you're grazing it short all the time and, and tight, then if it becomes a tussock, the base of that, you get a really sort of fat little 
sensors that will be as you know, like a little finger there. But if you cut them open, they're just white with starch, and the cattle go straight after them. And actually, I find that probably my best gains of the year are uh, end of February into March because the grass is not too green and washy, but they seem to have some energy there to go as well. mentioned earlier that you've moved to pedigree herd. Can you chat about that? Just uh, your motivation for it? Yeah, so it, it was it purely purely financial really. Uh, thank you. Uh, we wanted to be in control of the price we received for our product. And I think it's one of the issues we've all got family farms on. My one of the big concerns is what's going to happen to family farms long term. Um, because can we really, you know, long term, are we going to have people, can you produce a commodity on a small scale? Does that work in any other industry? Um, and so I think we've, go, we've got no choice but to go for niche markets. And for us, um, dad and grandfather had been in pedigree cattle all their lives, and we had a short time out, we were 10 years out of it. Um, and, uh, and so I knew I'd got that expertise at home. Um, you know, I loved all that stuff and the breeding side of it as well, and we could get a premium. And the other side of it was, we looked at whether we did direct sales to try and control the price a little bit more as well. Uh, but we figured if we can get um, if we can get the direct sell premium, but selling a live animal, then that's a lot less work, uh, and probably the same amount of marketing. So. Uh, and so that, and then the, I think I mentioned it. I think I mentioned it before was the fact that Dad, you know, pointed out that I was going off farm doing talks with them, and that it wasn't being a benefit. And that should we should try and align that. And I, you know, I respect him saying that, but you know, you've got to make it work. So if I'm going out showing what we're doing, then you know, if I believe in the product, then you know, if essentially if we're selling a cow to someone, it's got to make a living for them. We've got to believe in that cow to do it. Uh, it's in our interests. It's, well, it's not an altruistic thing. It's like um, if if that cow doesn't work for someone, we're not going to be in business a long time. And so, you know, ultimately, if we can provide something that works for someone else, then that we'll feel good about that, and it will help us. And the marketing thing as well was the one of the things that came from holistic management was this focus on on marketing, on where your where your best next spent pound is. So it's easy to go and buy the quad bike or upgrade the truck or whatever. But if you looked at that and thought, well, if I spend that money on marketing, is that going to give me a bigger return in the business? And I was lucky enough to have a dinner the other day with a chap, the farmer, who uh, uh, there was a few farmers around the table. But he'd started the, the Covent Garden Soup Company. It was a very, I don't know if you've come across that, where he was taking waste veg and turning it into a, a top-end soup. So his margins were... I think he said he was the most profitable food business in the UK after uh, Walker's Crisps. Um, and then he sold that business and he bought Green and Black's chocolate before anyone had heard of Green and Black's chocolate and then he'd done what he'd done with Green and Black's. But he was saying that he does venture capital as uh, investment now as well. And he was saying he's looking at these businesses coming to him. He's like, it's the norm to have 25, 30, 30, you know, 35 percent of your costs to be your sales and marketing. And so sometimes more. And yet in farming, you're lucky if there's one percent. You know, and I think that's something we've just got to no one's gonna buy your product unless you tell them about it. If they don't know about it, they can't buy it. You know, so, you know, so those are all the reasons and then the ability for us to have a, a relatively small farm um, to get that extra margin. What percentage of bulls born would actually leave the farm as breeding um, It's increasing all the time. Initially, we, we, with the cows that we were thinking with, so any cow that has a bull calf that requires any assistance is castrated. So those will all go as, as steers. And then those cows will be barked, and then we wouldn't keep a heifer or sell a heifer to someone as a breeding animal that's far from anything that needed assistance. So, but then actually quite quickly, I think because we, we, we were lucky with Dad's how we bought the right cattle to, to start with. Um, we've been able to, I think probably out of, we've got 25 
Um, 23 balls in the paddock at the moment, and there's probably three that I won't sell. So, uh, and we've got, you know, and it's, it's been good because, you know, we've, we've had a lot of interest in them. The, the heifer calves that were born in May um, are still on their mothers, and we, we'll be selling those in, in the spring, but those were already sold ahead of time. So, and that's nice to be in a position where you feel, you know, you've got that, you know, Absolute deposit, and you know you've got that sale in the future. When do you wean? Um, we wean at 10 months, so we, we try and have them sickly dry off for 60 days. Um, so we put them, bearing in mind the cows were out on that. Um, so, you know, we do, but we do work, them. they've got to work for us. And we, but we find that the rough forage plus a little bit of milk from the barn is actually is fabulous food for the calves. Um, and there's, a, there's some good research as well that with is leaving the calves on from seven months to ten months it has an impact, that extra milk has an impact and also the late lactation milk has a bigger impact on the number of villi inside the rumen so it increases the surface area of, of the rumen itself and, it, and the difference can be a 20 percent difference in, in forage conversion efficiency between the weaning at seven and ten months so that's one of the reasons we do that do any of your cows self wean i think some of them do yeah um, and certainly we know that with you know the, it's natural for cows to um, you know, shut the milk off about 60 days before they farm anyway, so that's, that's basically when we weed. So there's not a lot of stress at that time. And all we do is, the paddock they run on the bales there, is I just, there's, there's a gate at the corner, and we just ran a single wire, uh, and because the cards are more timid, um, we run a single wire with a, with a, with a six foot gap at the one end, and the dad's by the gap, one in front, and we just walk the cows out, leave the calves there, um, and then open the gate, the calves go through, and everyone's happy because they, they put their heads down, feed them at that time, and, and it's a nice, quiet process. You just fence line weed then, and they can, they can smell and sniff the calf out through the fence, and they seem to be happy with them. So far. What's sort of fence? Are they, is it electric fence or is it permanent fence? I've done it with both, uh, but I, I tend to do it with a permanent fence now. Just um like got net in two strands of bar. Rob, tell us about your health profile of your herd and your management system. Um we don't if you mean just in terms of like we don't vaccinate for anything. Um we haven't wormed in eighteen months anything. Um and it's amazing when you look back at the accounts how much money you spend on that stuff. Um and it was sort of survival of the fittest. I think we, we lost one, it's always your best calf, isn't it? So we lost one calf this year, so I think it must have been a foster ideal thing. Um, probably because I was trying to graze the pasture too tight, too close to the soil where the where that where the foster ideal bacteria are, because I wanted to, to overseed it. Um, but I find grazing tall helps a lot. So 80% of your worm larvae are in the first bottom four inches, and then um, and then the next 20% there's nothing above basically nothing above six inches. And I think also having that healthy uh, ecosystem around the soil. So you've got yes, you've got your soil life, but just above the soil life, you've got a lot of spiders, you've got ground beetles, um, and they're all going to be predators on the worm larvae. So if you get if you get rid of all of those, if you've only got white grass and foam, you've probably not got a lot of anything eating worm larvae. And I think those things in balance. You know, the ground beetles also eat mud snails, um, and so for fluke and that sort of thing, uh, I think that's a you know, that that has a big impact. So we have fluke or anything. Um, Do you have any other enterprises on farms or just uh, big cut? Um, so I uh, so I have a job as well. So I work outside the farm. 
Um, so that's an income. So the farm does have a holiday cottage business, but that's my sister and my mum's business. Um, and uh, my sister also runs a uh, the sports massage therapy and Pilates studio that she built on the farm. Um, so, but going back to the day job side of it is essentially, you know, you know, last year we opened like made twenty five grand profit. But I've got a if I take that as a salary, I <coughs> do and live off that. But then I've got I'm not investing my product profits back in the business. Um, so, um, I do cost my labour when I do the figures on the screen, um, but um, that I put up earlier on, but oh, you know, I just don't take that out of business, I just want to roll it back in. And I, I don't want to, we've got another opportunity to take on more land recently now, and I don't, I don't want to take on too much extra debt. So I'm just gonna, it's like any business, you know, if you, you, know, if you start a business making paper clips and you have a big order, you've got to reinvest your profits to grow. It's just, it's just what, when we did, you know, started school, we were only 50 acres when we started. Um, but long term, you know, the bull sales, so from the cards that were born this year, when we sell them in sort of 18 months time, um, I'll be in the position then where I don't have time to take it. But it's quite a useful job working for Natural England, is that it quite often gives me a way in on, on land or opportunities or whatever, so I'll probably be referring to it. I'll just, also on helping float the relation. No, and that's part of the problem, diversity. So the only time I've had a concern over it is a field, a ryegrass clover field that doesn't have a diversity in it. Um, but if you've got red clover or white clover, um, if you're on a heavier land and you can't grow sandpoint, then in particular bird's foot trefoil is very good, the legume, but it's got this high in condensed tannins, and that helps balance the, the clover in the room to prevent float. Um, so there's a, but there's a number of species that actually river plantains high end as well as the same impact. But basically, if you've got a really diverse sward, then it, it, it won't be. Really <coughs> I think you can, you know, and if you haven't gone that, or if you want to stick to the, to the ryegrass and clover or whatever, you know, it makes sense in some situations. Like <coughs> some tree fodder or some willow trees around the edge of the field or in the, in the hedge and the edges. Um, again, tannins and that can also help with that. No mineral supplements. No, we do mineral supplement as well. And that's something you sometimes hear people say that, oh, you've got all the soil perfect now and it's all this life and you don't need to add, add any mineral in. But one of the ways we, on all of our farms actually, we are, we're low in cobalt selenium. And so they get a cobalt selenium and copper salt lick, which is made by Rockies, which is an organic one. Uh, it's called SC cattle. Um, and that is brilliant. And you know, I notice if I take that out, uh, within two weeks, the, the coats go a bit duller and you just notice the difference. Um, and I think it's, it, in a natural grazing system, wild herbivores, whatever, would be ranging over how many different soil types? Every soil type. So they'd be getting all the different minerals. And I think, that, um, I think that's important. And you could potentially reduce your frame size further, so body condition has a, a big impact on both um, the ability to cope with a lack of certain minerals, so if they've got more body fat they can cope with that better, but also with parasite burden as well. Um, but I think putting in, some, um, putting in some mineral blocks so that we can run a slightly bigger cow and not have a really small one that's not fitting market requirements is worth us. Trade for us. <coughs> Obviously, you have to move those blocks if you're rotationally grazing. Or you just have them everywhere. Yeah, no, I just move to pick them up, move them, just pick them up, throw them to the next block. Yeah. Would you keep your hands in the very um, We just do a judgment based on uh, locomotion, on their udder, and their body condition, and that they have a calf. And if they, if, if all of that's okay, they stay. Um, you know, we want to be having cows regularly reach 15 years in production. And, um, you know, the reality is you probably, with a, with, a, with a young cow, you're probably, not until she's seven year old, that you're actually making any money out of her. And it's interesting that the industry standard is to tell people they should cull eight year old cows, and don't really get that. But that replacement rate has a big impact on profit, doesn't it? So, 
you touched on water earlier on. Can you just go through a bit more on your water system for your rotation grazing on your different blocks? Yeah, so each field has got a water source uh, on mains, and basically we run and the one field, the one farm we've got has got 135 acre field, and so we just ran pipe underground to 11 standpoint to 11 locations, which meant that we could run a, a mobile drag trough on a 150 meter pipe so we could reach every paddock basically from any of those standpoints. Um, and so, yeah, we just drag, we have an overland pipe. Um, and we just dragged that the drag trough. It's a Kiwi Tech drag trough, which is quite expensive. I think it's like 250 quid, but it's worth every penny. It's fast flow as well, on a, uh, even on low pressure. And when you've got you know 70 cows around a trough, it needs to be fast flow, otherwise they start making a mess of it. So it's um, so that works really well for it. The other thing we do is we plan our winter grazing so that so at the one bar we've got. There's a, a lake river, it's a fake river, but it's a lake. Um, but there's about a mile of bank that we've got next to that. So we'll save that right through the winter so that we know that if everything's frozen, we can just graze cattle next to that and break the ice. Uh, and then where we've got the standpipes in the fields as well, we'll just we'll save the grass next to the standpipes um, it, until it's really frozen, just because we've got that overland pipe risk. And then if I haven't had the ability to do that, what I've also done is, is most of the time in the UK, we, our daytime temperatures are above freezing. So if we go about three, four o'clock in the afternoon, and I fill four or five tubs of water, about the same size as the water trough, then I'll disconnect the overground pipe from the mains, empty the pipe, and then when I come back and it's all frozen in the morning, I've only got to defrost a small stamp pipe, and I can get everything running straight away. And I haven't got cows fighting over a water truck. How are we doing? Is that all good? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much.